Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And now, as usual, to the front pages of the papers. I said they were menacing for the Prime Minister. This is what I was talking about. There is the Sunday Telegraph. Theresa May, it says, faces the challenge of a stalking horse leadership contest if she reneges in any way on Brexit. And there is the Sunday Times. Tories tell May you have ten days to pull it together. The Observer has a story, which we'll talk about in a moment, about the tower block fire warnings that ministers, it says, ignored. And a Brexit story as well. Then there is the Mail on Sunday. They've gone with Theresa May's. I have let down the firefighters. Not quite what she said. She said they've been let down overall. She didn't say it was my responsibility specifically, I don't think. And many, many other papers covering the same sort of material. Um, Victoria Derbyshire, you were there all the way through the, the fire, the post-fire um, crisis. And every single paper, I think, virtually, has a big, long read-through yes. to take you through. The question really is, after all we've seen, is it worth going through and sitting down on a Sunday morning and reading the whole story again? I think so, yes, because it takes you from the beginning to where we are now. And there are new stories, um, new eyewitness accounts, and it begins here in the Sunday Times with the damning headline, An Inferno That Shames Us All. And it begins by telling us about somebody receiving a phone call from their sister in the burning tower block. This is Sorsan Chukar one of the many relatives of Grenfell residents who was awoken in the small hours of Wednesday morning by a telephone call from her sister, Nadia. I mean, just, you receive a phone call in the early hours of the morning from your sister saying, I'm trapped on the 22nd floor in a burning tower block. I mean, it just, you can't, it, it's unimaginable. Um, Sarsan says, Nadia loved the views, but like everyone, she was worried it wasn't safe there. They knew it wasn't safe, didn't they? I mean, the residents knew ahead of time, well ahead of time, that this was a dangerous building and raised the thing again and again, Ian, with Kensington and Chelsea Borough Council above all. Well, they did. And what I think a lot of people don't understand is the, the management organisation for the Tower Block, it had a majority of tenants as members. There were eight tenant members, four local councillors and three independents. So you think, well... If these concerns have been raised so often, why didn't the management organisation take them seriously? Part of the answer to that, I think, is that the residents on it were there really as advisers. They weren't there as voters to kind of impose sprinkler systems. And in the end, they were, they were reliant on the experts, they were reliant on the council to, to ensure but, that they were the, safe. Sorry, to okay. the, re the residents said we were regarded as troublemakers. Yeah. We were regarded as troublemakers and, and, and just therefore on the ignored. Day, we all saw these blogs that had been written last year or the year before detailing what the concerns were. And I think, I mean, everyone's got theories of how this happened, but the cladding does seem to be. A, a very important one and why is it that if this cladding was banned in America banned in Germany and other countries why was it allowed to be used here now ministers are getting the flack for this and, and in some ways we'll come on to that some ministers probably deserve to but on this particular one you ministers have to be reliant on the experts to advise them why weren't the experts saying no this is not material that we should be using on buildings in this country well some of the experts were talking about Pfizer um, including a uh, former a fireman and, and a fire safety expert in the House of Commons. That's the front page of The Observer. Yeah, so Ronnie King, you might have seen him on TV this week as well, um, the head of the parliamentary group on fire safety, talking about not only government ministers not having meetings with him, but also um, ignoring requests to think about sprinklers in tower blocks, but also in schools. Um, and the sense from him that this change only happens when people die. Um, and this is the thing we keep hearing, is that this was avoidable. And I think that is the big thing, why when you speak to victims and when you, you go to that area, people are so angry because it just feels like this, this, these many lives lost should Need just not have, not been lost. have yes. happened. And you've got, I think, the mirror's got a similar sort of story there. Yeah, about the mirror, I mean, this is what's going to happen now. We've got to go and look at not just fire regulation, not just why residents weren't listened to, which I think is more about, you know, 
actually being treated sometimes as second-class citizens. Again, they say that. They don't want to listen to us. They don't think our lives are important. Um, but there's also, you know, what, what role have the cuts had? You know, how much money did the council have to redo this? Why did they cut those corners? So we have to span across it. In the mirror, it talks about um, the number of fire safety audits has dropped quite dramatically from around 85,000 in 2010 to 63,000. Um, mm. The number, the, the amount of money available um, for fire safety service budgets has also reduced quite dramatically so how is this all fed in mm. to to this horrible tragedy I mean, you, I mean people are blaming austerity for this and it, it, this will hopefully all come out in the public inquiry but they, the council were spending 10 million pounds refurbishing this block now there will be all sorts of arguments about how they is. did it the fire safety stuff, yeah. Yeah. They? No, well I, they I'm made not, it look I'm not, prettier but they didn't make it look safer but in, in the end it's got to be the experts who've got to be held mm. to account here because yeah. it, if, if it turns out that someone said to the council, you are making a major mistake doing this uh, well, in, the the, in this way. The residents no, said but, that. But, but if, the expert, if the fire experts sort of put it through, and, the, and this cladding is allowed in this country, I mean, it obviously shouldn't be, but it is, then you, you can't... You, you, you can't lay this all at the door of national politicians, can you? I wouldn't say but all at the door, but you have to think at every level what happened and the mistakes that were made. And, you know, exactly. and they, were made, they made those decisions so, I mean, because one, they, maybe one, they didn't one, have the one budget. Of the so. afterwards, I think we have to say Kensington Council have not responded to this very well. There weren't enough people on the ground. The phone lines were either engaged no or, or not ground. being operated. Yeah. And th there, is, there is a story, I think, in the Sunday Times this morning has suggested that the government has asked the senior officers of Kensington and yeah. Chelsea well, Borough Council right to too. step down, quite step right aside, and I'll tell walk you what, away. That from that the vote. leader of Kensington Council, Nick Paget Brown, he's got a lot of questions to answer here. How he is in his job, particularly after what the Prime Minister said yesterday, saying they had basically failed the local people, um, I think he should be considering we, his position. We, we've asked uh, Kensington and Chelsea Borough Council to come on, yeah, and they I'm haven't sure been able have. to answer us. Well, I, I they did for are, six hours on my show last week. Do you think we weren't. are? Do you think we are quite close to the, the, the council being in effect suspended by the government? I think we are very close to that. I mean, I, I don't know what the equivalent of special measures is. We know that's for schools. But they, they have failed their local people. It is absolutely abundantly clear on that. No one can talk to them. Uh, they, they choose the interviews that right. they do. They, they will choose news organisations yeah. where the, the, the local people don't even watch. What, what yes. Was it? Can I just, sorry, sorry. Uh, because it's very easy to get into the blame thing yeah. and who's to blame. It's very, very yeah. important to do that. But this is also a human story. Mm. Um, and, Victoria, you've got the story there of a very, very talented artist who was killed in the fire. This is in the observer. just on the edge of becoming incredibly famous. She was just on the edge of success. This is about Khadija Say. Um, this is in the observer. This is a picture of her mum, who is also missing, presumed dead. And Khadija Say, a piece written here by a friend of hers called Sanaz Lover Hadi, who is from Iran originally. Khadija was from Gambia originally. Uh, Sanaz writes, we both grew up in very small flats with strong mothers and we joke about how as children we were quite shy about inviting friends over, not only because of the size of our homes, but because they were filled with foreign objects that our friends would ogle at. And the final paragraph is very moving. My most poignant memory of Khadija is a recent one. We were at a pub after work when a lady who'd been drinking nearby stopped to speak to us. I wasn't really listening to what you were talking about, but I just wanted to say what a lovely way you have of speaking to each other. How wonderful your friendship seems, she told us. Khadija's broad smile and soft chuckle rang out again as we said thank you. Then she began laughing all over again. That moment will always stay with me. And Khadija uh, was a photographer. And she, I think she'd been selected for the Venice Biennale, friend of David Lammy's. And you can see her photographs. You can go online to her website. And they are remarkable photographs, particularly black and white um, or sepia photographs mm. of Gambian women. It's about Gambian women's experience. Really interesting. That is a story about two Londons, I suppose. I mean, there they are on the top of the flat. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just want to say, we never hear these stories about how much talent is in these tower blocks. We assume, and, and you know, you watch every programme, whether it be drama or a documentary, or, you know, we hear about these places being filled with alcoholics and criminals and what have you, and that's the sense. But actually, having grown up near these places and with friends of, you know, that lived in these places, they are full of talented people, you know, young people with hope. And it's, yeah. you know, it's so very painful. Um, and, and that you, story of those story two Londoners. I think, haven't you there? Yeah, so this is um, a comment oh, piece from Ed Philemy um, on just sort of his recounts of growing up in that neighbourhood um, and how it's been 
it's gentrified over time. Um, you've had this real pull towards and the rich moving in and then the poor and this basically nothing in between. And we've seen that actually in quite a few neighbourhoods, including, say, Islington, where we have those that remain in social housing and then the very rich that can afford... The it's been a very divided part of London for a very long time. It's the same part of London, not far from the Rackman uh, scandals back in the 1950s and 60s of kind of rack racketeering landlords right the just just around the corner from huge palatial buildings not much has changed to that extent it is probably the most divided part of London yeah I think people forget that there's poor people living there and there's people on lower incomes living there I think the Labour vote and the, that win by 20 votes mm. reminded people that it's not just the rich that live in, the, in that neighbourhood but I think in this block there were owner occupied flats this was actually a very mixed block it what you're absolutely right to say it wasn't the sort of stereotypical uh, tower block that some people might imagine. It None was, of them there, there was, I mean, well, yeah. okay, but the, the, in here you had all sorts of different people living alongside each other. It was actually a, a, almost a good example of multicultural London. Let's move on to mainstream politics, Ian, if we may, just we a bit. I'm afraid, <laughs> we, I'm afraid even on this morning we do. Tim Shipman, who is probably the doyen at the moment of political correspondent, yeah. political editor of the Sunday Times, has really gone for Theresa May this morning. Well, they all have, all the papers have. Uh, Tory sharks are circling as the Prime Minister suffers yet another disastrous week. And he's detailing the angst on the Conservative backbenches. The Sunday Telegraph has a story on the front uh, page saying that there could be a stalking horse candidate, which shows a, a, a lack of understanding of the leadership. Can I ask rules. an unpopular but essential question at this moment? Is this fair? Uh, what is what fair? On the Prime Minister, that she is responsible for all things going wrong She's blunder woman. If you she, think about it, on, on the 18th dead. of April, the day she announced the election, she was considered a political colossus. And yet in, in two months, I mean, now what, the 18th of June, um, her reputation has descended as, as, as to somebody who is without power. However, Tory MPs should be careful what they wish for. Because if, if they do oust her, and I actually don't think they will, but if they do oust her, what happens then? They have mm. to have a new leader. Who is that new leader going to be so, who, to take on Jeremy Corbyn? If they oust her, they, they increase the likelihood of another general election, which they will lose, and Jeremy Corbyn will be Prime Minister. That ought to concentrate a few minds on the Tory backbench. Absolutely. And even before you get to that, they have to have a leadership contest, which mm. means that the entire Brexit process is pushed off for another six weeks, or whatever it might it, be. Exactly. Disastrous. And I think... I mean, Theresa May, again, went from hero to zero in a week. Last Monday at the 1922 committee, she showed all the qualities that she'd showed before as Prime Minister, and yet here we are, almost a week on, when she's fighting for her political life again. I think that her reaction to this disaster has been understandable in a way. She had advice that she, she had to leave that church on when it was, whenever it was on, on, on Friday. She's actually spent hours with... And she was community allegedly leaders on the edge with of the victims tears with and all the, the rest of it. What well, we heard last night on the news when she invited the people into Downing Street, it wasn't Downing Street spinners that were saying that she had broken down in tears. It was a local vicar who had been in the meeting and had seen her tear up on several occasions, holding the hand of a woman next to her. Now, I'd she rather, could have met I, residents on Thursday. She could have read, well, but if you are advised as a Prime Minister by your security detail not to, what, I mean, you can, you can overrule them, you're absolutely right. And in retrospect, that proved to be a mistake. I, I do agree with you. And what are they saying about the Prime Minister on the streets around Vic, the Tower at the moment, Victoria? Um, I, I heard them say things like, what is she doing here? Uh, at, at that point, that was on Thursday morning, we didn't know she hadn't met residents at that point, it was only afterwards. Uh, when, when they realised that residents had been met, she hadn't been met, she talked to firefighters, uh, they described her as a coward. And Faisa, very, very briefly, from your perspective, what is, what is the political significance of this moment? Do you think this is a turning point in the country? No, I just think it, she's proven herself not to be able to lead in the last week. She's, at, every, at every point, her hand has been forced, whether it be going to meet the victims, putting some money together. Um, you know, even with this, the council standing down, it just feels like it, it's all after the fact, after people are protesting. And this is a very important people, moment people, okay, that's for the Conservative want, Party in general. People instant reactions here. And in a way, she's damned as she does and yeah. damned as she does. We've, we've had both sides now. Faisa, Ian, Victoria, thank you all very much for the paper review. <laughs> The Observer says that ministers missed several opportunities to tighten fire safety rules before the Grenfell Tower tragedy. The Sunday Express leads with the Queen's message that the UK has been resolute in the face of adversity in recent months. A picture of her grandson, Prince William, meeting victims of the fire is on the front of the Sunday Mirror. 
The Sunday Telegraph focuses on the pressures growing on Theresa May, saying she faces a leadership challenge if she softens her position on Brexit. The Sunday Times says Conservative MPs have given the Prime Minister 10 days to shape up or ship out. And the Mail on Sunday reports on Theresa May's admission last night that the Grenfell Tower families have been let down. Well, to talk about all that and more, we're joined now by the former advisor to Boris Johnson, MD of Public Affairs at Edelman, Will Walden, the assistant editor of The Tab, Diora Shadi Genova, and European policy expert, Nina Schick. Hello, thanks very much for morning. being with us Good today. Morning. Um, it feels like we should talk about the story that's obviously on the front page of every newspaper, mm. which is the fire. Diora, what have you made of the political reaction to the fire? Yeah, I think everyone's been criticising Jeremy Corbyn for sort of politicising the, tra the tragedy. Um, but I think that's, you know, it's really incorrect to assume that because I think Theresa May has just failed to connect with the public and people are seeing that. And, you know, Jeremy Corbyn shouldn't really be blamed for Theresa May's shortcomings. Interesting. What do you um, make of it? Because there has been quite a marked difference, of course, in how Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May have reacted to the fire. Well, I think Theresa May is not very good at showing empathy and people are very, very cross and they want somewhere to direct their anger. And the fact that she's come across so wooden in her public appearances means that people are directing their anger at her. And I think that this could, depending on how angry the public continues to be, could indeed perhaps even lead to her downfall. But we'll see. There's no doubt she's had a terrible week. Uh, emp empathy is a, is a difficult thing if it doesn't come naturally to you. She's a very private person. Um, she's clearly made mistakes. And if she'd gone originally and uh, faced those residents, I think you know she would have been shouted down. But I think politicians need to be seen to being shouted down. It, it's not a case of her hugging anybody. I don't think anyone expects her to put her arm around anybody like, like, like Corbyn did. But the important thing now is that the government appear to have got more of a grip on the situation and they appear to, reading in the Sunday Times, they, they've sent officials in from Whitehall and from other councils used to crisis. And that's the important thing, is, is to sort out the problems now and, and get these, these things done. Just on the Corbyn point, mm. um, it, it, he was absolutely right to go and, you know, he's good at that sort of thing. He's good at empathy. Where I think he's overplayed his hand is the idea of requisitioning, housing and, and the like. You talked to John McDonnell uh, about it. That, to my mind, doesn't feel like a sensible solution because it's going to take so long. These people People need houses now and they need help now and that hopefully is what the government of the council is now providing. Do you think that's an example then of perhaps Jeremy Corbyn trying to politicise the... Um, yeah, I definitely see where people... Um, yeah, I, I do see where they're coming from when they talk about that but I think people are looking for a leader right now and they're failing to see one in Theresa May and, you know, obviously the next best thing is Jeremy Corbyn because he's the leader of the opposition. So there is no leader. Jeremy Corbyn's there, Theresa May isn't, and that's the situation we've got. It's quite an interesting point, because I think sometimes, as journalists, we write how terrible mm. it is when politicians are out there getting shouted at that, having a tough time, like yeah. Sadiq Khan, like Andrea Leadsom had been this week. But I suppose in some ways you could argue that actually people showing that they are listening to that yeah. raw anger is not necessarily a PR disaster. It can be quite a good thing. I think so, and I think that some of the comments around at least Andrea Letson being there and addressing some of the anger mean that she, people feel that she's done a better job than Theresa May. I mean, those photos of her behind the cordon of policemen was an absolute PR disaster when the Queen was there, you know, and she was talking to the residents and people who were affected. So it's been a really bad week for her, and I think this follows on, obviously, a series of incidents. We're still reeling from the results of the general election, so her premiership is much weakened. Well, let's talk about that premiership, shall we? Uh, because on the front page of the Sunday Times, we have this headline, Tories tell May you have 10 days. Will, does that ring true to you? Do you think she really has got 10 days to sort this out? No, not necessarily. I, I, Tim Shipman, very experienced political editor, and he will have been talking to people. There are a number of stories across a variety of papers this morning that suggest that she's on, uh, on borrowed time. Um, but if you read the detail, it talks about the fact that maybe 12 MPs are ready to send a letter to the 1922 committee. Um, they need 48 for a, um, a vote of no confidence in her. That's a long way from it. I think at its worst, Cameron got to sort of 25 five letters, in, I think, in 2013. I think the true picture, uh, what they are saying is um, you need to 
pull up your A-game um, and we're watching you. Uh, she's got some time to do that. I think the backbench sentiment that I sense is that um, any move against her now or any weakening of her to the point where she had to go at this stage would be catastrophic for the Conservative Party because it, they would almost certainly have to call an election, there would almost certainly be an election that they may lose. It feels a bit like she's on borrowed time though, doesn't it? That it's only a matter of time before someone does come forward. Maybe your old boss, Boris Johnson? <laughs> uh, that's a question for him. He's made, he's made it very, very clear that, that, that he's 100% behind the Prime Minister, as many people have. And I think it's important actually that she's given the space to govern. It's not been good for her. But I think what we should remember, um, for example, is that she enjoyed catastrophic, catastrophic, excuse me, um, um, uh, stratospheric approval ratings uh, before the election and, and actually was seen to have done a decent job as Prime Minister. Clearly her confidence uh, has been knocked. She's got some important things ahead. The Queen's speech coming up uh, on, on Wednesday and getting that, uh, that, that through, the DUP deal uh, and Brexit. But she was always a much better Prime Minister than she she was campaigner and the issues around Grenfell Tower, terrible as they are and her response to them, poor as they have been, um, probably doesn't mark what she is like as a Prime Minister. Jeremy Corbyn, just quickly, was uh, a poor leader of the opposition and a very good campaigner and they're back in those roles now. Let's talk quickly, uh, uh, finally, about this Boris Johnson column, shall we? He's written in the uh, Sunday Times, not hard, not soft. An open Brexit is best. Nina, what's your take on the on what Boris Johnson's got to say? Is well, <laughs> we've heard a lot since the results of the general election what type of Brexit this is going to be. And I think the first thing to point out is that the results of the general election actually mean that the crash out scenario, the no deal scenario, the chances of that have gone up. Simply because the EU27 are ready to negotiate, their broad guidelines are set. And when you're coming to the table to negotiate and you have no idea what your end aim is, whether there's going to be a transitional agreement, whether there's going to be an FTA, it's very, very difficult when the clock is already ticking to see how those talks are not going to be marred by domestic political events here in the UK. So it's fair enough to say it's going to be an open Brexit, but if this is the kind of open Brexit we want, that also means being liberal on things like immigration, which we know one side of the Conservative Party is very much against. Big questions such as, do we accept the jurisdiction of the ECJ? Uh, if there is a transitional period, are we ready to be in the Norway model or the customs union, which would mean that the UK is unable to strike free trade deals? So, although it sounds good, you know, there's a, a lot of work to be done before we can have this type okay. of idealised open Brexit. On but. that uh, not very reassuring note, <laughs> um, we're out of time. Um, thanks very much for coming in and giving your thoughts uh, today. Well, it's been a week which will shape our politics for years to come because at Grenfell House we've seen the most appalling breach of a social contract that underpins our democracy, our way of life. A contract between those like me, lucky enough to have a home and a voice, that we would never put the vulnerable and voiceless in harm's way. So, most of us have two instincts today. One is to unite to support and help the victims of the conflagration. The other is to argue about who and what was to blame. We need to know whether ministers, officials and contractors were negligent or reckless. We need to judge whether the policies of this government or previous ones were at fault. Grenfell shows why political disengagement, apathy is irresponsible. It shows why politics matters. Doesn't it, Allegra? And by the way, welcome back. Yes, Robert. In the two months I've been away, there's been two terror attacks and now this high-rise hell, a gruesome period. Now, it was one thing to hide away during an election you yourself called, but to hide away as the nation grieved to Theresa May's reputation and relationship with the public to new lows last week. And she seems to get this. On the front of the mail, she is admitting, I've let the fire families down. Meanwhile, without her, the public have been stepping up to the challenge and we just thought we'd run through how. Um, so, people have been donating. These three uh, uh, petitions together have raised some £4 million. Then over here, you've got change.org and uh, this is all the different ideas people are coming up with. So the first here, some uh, 150,000 have signed this petition, sprinklers to be fitted in all high-rise buildings. It was set up by Tracy Cutler in Southampton. It's quite interesting because some people out there think that petitions are very often set up about by people in London about London, not so with this one. And then you have here, under 120,000, want a fully transparent investigation and this, this one 
implement the Lacanal report. This is a, a report that looked into another deadly fire in South London in 2009. You can see 150,000. And then look at these. These are what these are the articles being shared online on Facebook in particular. Down here, women offering free, free flats to tower residents. But then these two at the top, showing the amount of criticism the Prime Minister is facing. The top two articles, protesters chanting, Theresa May must go, and then Theresa May you're surrounded by protesters chanting coward. The anger directed at our very lonely Prime Minister is incredible. There are, however, people out there defending her, urging caution, some decorum. Have a look at this. Brendan Cox, he says, we should focus on structural and political injustices that cause Grenfell rather than fixate on May's character. Latter misses the point. Robert. Thanks, Allegra. Now, joining me now are... To plain speaking MPs, uh, Sarah Wollaston from the Tories, David Lammy from Labour. Sarah, if I could just start with you. The Prime Minister's admission yesterday that the government had not responded effectively to this crisis is hugely damaging for her and the government, isn't it? Because whatever else people think of her, she's supposed to be competent. Yes, you expect that a machine will swing into place to put support in there immediately. And clearly that didn't happen. There was an unacceptable delay. Why do you think that was? I don't know, is the answer. I think we all expect those kinds of things to happen, and it didn't in this situation. And we need to put that, I think, into the terms of the inquiry, as to say, if this happens again, we all hope and pray it won't. But if it does, we need to be sure that there's an organisation that can swing into place to, to help uh, people who've been... And, and just very briefly, before I move to David, yes. I mean, how much has this shaken, do you think, the confidence of you and your colleagues in her effectiveness as Prime Minister? Well, I mean, clearly, it is very damaging for her personally. I think some of the criticisms are, are unwarranted. I, I think to, to imply that she doesn't care about this, I, I simply don't believe that. Um, I believe that she cares about it profoundly, um, but doesn't show it in the way that other people perhaps would do in that situation. She should undoubtedly have met the victims when she went to visit. David, um, although, of course, this has happened on the watch of the current government, some of the apparent structural flaws which have led to this disaster were in place during the years of Labour government. I think this is, to some extent, beyond party. But I do think there are big questions about what we think the state is for. Um, if you lose your home, burnt to the ground, you're standing only in your pyjamas, um, why do you pay your council tax if the council isn't for you and supporting you in those circumstances? There will be many of your viewers who give money to organisations like Oxfam when they see a disaster in another part of the world and action kicks in to support the very poorest, yet in this developed economy we couldn't do that. That, 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 that theme of the withdrawal of the state, and here I'm, I'm afraid the truth is there is a collapse in social housing. I think that there are, I, I would hope there are Conservative colleagues that accept that because there's been an abandonment of social housing. That is a deliberate policy. We had a debate in Parliament last year and we moved away from social housing. And basically a lot of these blocks across the country are being run down. But, it, but, it, but in fairness... David, uh, there is obviously an important debate about the provision of social housing, but this is, this, th what's happened here is not about the quantity of social housing, it's about the quality of social housing. And we do know that during the Labour years, there also, on your analysis, there wasn't enough investment even in the existing stock. I accept that. Uh, and I said as much in Parliament at the time, and a few years ago when I wanted to be London Mayor, I was campaigning on that issue. Do we believe in council... Um, buildings? Do we believe that there are some people in society um, uh, and it's a, it's a fine thing to live uh, in social housing and do we want to invest in those blocks? We are building penthouses in London. They have fire extinguishers in every corner. They have hose pipes. They have alarms that work. They have sprinklers. Why is it that those buildings being built today can have that but people in social housing can't? And given we haven't got enough housing in this country for everybody, we have to invest in social housing. We can't just leave it to housing associations. That was the debate in Parliament last year and this government chose to go in a completely Completely different David, direction. I'm going to pick up on all of these points with you a little bit later. I've been